com forward slash weather. It is 23 minutes to seven. Now, at just 18 years of age, Samuel Brownridge was identified by two witnesses as the gunman responsible for the 1994 execution-style murder of a man in Queens, New York. He was sentenced to at least 25 years in prison. But Samuel consistently maintained his innocence, saying that he'd been at home at the time. And last month, in an emotional hearing, he was finally cleared of any wrongdoing. We're speaking to him live in a moment, but here's Lorna Shaddock with more on this incredible story. I hereby vacate your convictions and dismiss the indictment against you, and I wish you good luck, sir. That was the moment Samuel Brownridge had been waiting for, for over a quarter of a century. Thank you. He was just 18 when he was wrongly jailed for a murder he didn't commit. In 2003, three other people convicted for the killing testified the real shooter was this man, Garfield Brown. Despite that, Sam served 25 years of his sentence. He was released last March, but on lifetime parole, still fighting to clear his name. But meanwhile, Donna Aldea's law firm had taken on a former fellow inmate of Sam's as a paralegal. He brought Sam's case to her and she began rebuilding it. Last month, in an online hearing, his conviction was finally quashed, bringing everyone to tears. I don't think no one who's ever been incarcerated knows how it feels to be locked up, especially when they're innocent. Judges are not supposed to cry in court, but that was very touching for me to hear. The judge told Sam that everyone in the justice system had failed him, but thanks to Donna, he now has more hope that system can be reformed. I'm delighted to say that Samuel joins us now from Maryland, along with his lawyer, Donna Aldea, who is in New York. Good morning to both of you. Thank you so much for joining us. I mean, Sam, um, I, I wonder if you ever get tired of listening to the judge saying those words and crushing that sentence and saying, you know, you're a free man. Never. <laughs> what, what, what was, I mean, it was such an emotional moment, clearly, and emotional for the judge as well. I kind of taking you back to that 18 year old who suddenly gets picked up and identified uh, for this crime. I can't imagine how terrifying that must have been at that young age to suddenly be dragged into a police station and be identified for a crime that you didn't commit. Uh, well, it was, uh, it was a scary situation, but I always had faith in it. It never really set in that I would be there for 25 years. So. I always just, today is going to be the day I walk out of there. That was just the, the, the vision I had every morning. I hope that one day they come there and say, all right, we cleared you. Your name has been cleared. You can go home. But that never happened. But that's, and, Sam, it's easy to, I'm sorry, it's easy to say that, isn't it? But for the first few months, you kind of think, right, surely today's the day, surely today's the day. But time goes on and time goes on. And in 2003, 2004, when, the, when you're getting a retrial and you think, right, this is the time when they're going to show that I was innocent. And then that trial gets thrown out. And then it's not till 25 years later. How on earth does somebody maintain their hope through 25 years of being let down over and over again by the legal system over there? Well, support. You have, I, had made, I had a good support system, so that really kept me going, my family and... I just never gave up. I always thought one day that my name would be cleared. I just, it was just something that I knew would happen. I didn't know when, but it's like things you want. It never happened when you want it to happen, but it did happen. It took 26 years for it to happen. I'm so happy that it did. But every day that you wake up is another day of hope in life that you can do something and go forward. And that's just what I had every day. And Donna, the whole um, conviction rested not upon of course, any evidence, because there simply wasn't any because he didn't do it. But it rested upon two people who had pointed uh, Sam out as the man that they thought they saw committing the murder. Um, and it, that's extraordinary, isn't it? That the eyewitness accounts, which we know, um, even, I'm sure, 25 years ago, eyewitnesses weren't used solely as the only form of evidence, were they? I mean, what, how could this have happened? How could he have been convicted of something he didn't do on the basis of two people simply saying, we think he's the one who did it? Eyewitness testimony is very powerful. And 
it I think in recent times there is more of a recognition of the failings of memory, the failings of observation, the failings of eyewitness testimony. But at the time, it was certainly used and it could be used as the sole evidence of a conviction. And it has led to a great many wrongful convictions like in Sam's case. Um, but the problems in his case were deeper. It was there were issues with the eyewitness identifications even then that could have been properly disclosed at trial to a jury and those identifications could have been undermined. But there was evidence that was exculpatory that was withheld from the defense at the trials. And so it really was a failing on multiple levels of the judicial system. It was um, it was one of uh, Sam's ex inmates, Don, who'd started working with you, hadn't he, uh, Donna, that, that brought you Samuel's case. What did you think when you originally presented with this case uh, and, and the history and what he'd been through? I thought that it was going to be virtually impossible. Um, when Don first presented the case to us, I looked at it. I looked at the procedural history. I saw that Sam had already been in jail for, at that point, it was 20 years, a little bit over 20 years. He had already exhausted his direct appeal. He had been convicted by a jury, exhausted his direct appeal. He had already filed a post-conviction motion, had had a hearing where all of the witnesses that we were relying on had testified and where the perpetrator, the actual perpetrator, mm. Garfield Brown, had been identified. So procedurally, this case had gone all the way up through our judicial system, through federal habeas corpus. I thought procedurally it was going to be impossible. But Don believed in his innocence, believed in the case, and um, convinced us that it was worth fighting for. And sometimes when you believe that a cause is right, it's worth fighting for regardless of what the odds are. And that's what we did. And Sam, um one hopes that there will be some form of, you know, financial compensation to you or otherwise that, that will be pursued now on your behalf. But of course, that won't bring you back the years that you missed your family life, your children growing up. Um, you don't, uh, you must have a lot of bitterness, but you appear to be able to ride it and see beyond it. Can you just explain how you do that? Because I think people you know, deal with things in their lives far, far less than that and live and, you know, sort of mm, nurture a bitterness towards people and systems and things for their whole lives. And you appear not to be doing that. Well, uh, you can't have bitterness. You just got to be happy for what you have at this time. And I have a lot of things to look forward to. I can be a father, a husband. I'm about to be a grandfather. So I have a lot of positive things in my life that I just... If, if I wouldn't have been out of jail, I wouldn't have been able to enjoy them. So I have to appreciate what I have and go on with life and enjoy my life. And what were the things, you know, during that period of time in jail that you, I mean, you didn't rest, you kept your brain busy. You were learning and developing the whole time, weren't you? Just talk to us a bit about how you did that and what you, what you achieved in a sense whilst being incarcerated wrongly. Well, you, you do a lot of reading communicating with your family and you, you you take sometimes you just got to take time out to just relax and settle your mind because if not it's a lot of things that can get you going the wrong way in there and that's not what you want it's a, it's extraordinary talking to sam donner and seeing his positivity and his lack of bitterness because i would be so angry if i'd had those years up before me but it's an it's an important question how do you compensate mm. a human being for 25 years some might say some of the best years of his life being taken from you. I mean, what is that road going to be like for Samuel? And will there be some sort of a conversation that can alleviate some of that? That road is very long and very difficult. There are a lot of hurdles that the legal system imposes. There's uh, absolute prosecutorial immunity. So in terms of establishing misconduct by a prosecutor, it's very difficult to overcome that hurdle of prosecutorial immunity. The police have qualified immunity. So the, the legal battle in order to try to achieve monetary compensation is very long and very difficult and fraught with obstacles. Um, and there have been a lot of movements for um, pushing for reform of some of that system mm. because it is so difficult 
to achieve accountability and to obtain compensation in cases like this. But it certainly is going to be a battle. And the reality is that whatever financial compensation there may be for him, as you said, there's nothing that's going to bring back those 25 years. It's very important, I think, that people look and understand what led to this conviction because it failed. Our legal system failed him on so many levels, at every possible level. Every check and balance failed here. And so it's important, I think, that we understand it so that we can reform it, so that we can see what went wrong and prevent it from happening again. And I think that I know that Sam wants that. And in fact, it is hearing the one thing he said he wanted more than anything else, um, aside from his life again, um, was really reform, was people learning from what happened so that the system can be fixed. And I think that's that's what we need to get from this. Well, look, you're an extraordinary um, sort of uh, shining light, Sam, to have gone through what you've gone and still be smiling and still be sort of appreciative of everything that's that's in front of you rather than angry about what's behind you. It's lovely to meet you. And, uh, and what you said earlier, I've written down and it's going to stay with me. But every day you wake up is another day of hope. And I think that's a little motto that I'm going to keep with me for many years. So thank you for joining us and sharing your story. And good luck with the future. Yeah, and congratulations absolutely. on being a granddad. Yeah, that's going thank to be exciting. <laughs> the wisdom you will impart will be quite unique, I imagine, to that uh, grandchild important. that's on its way to you. Samuel Bramage, Lucky thank you very much. Thing. And Donna as well, thank you for yeah. that, that fight and, and, and sharing the story. And, and good luck to both of you as well. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. I like that. Every day Gosh. you wake up is another day of hope. Yeah, it's quite stunning, isn't it? I don't know. And as, as, I get as cross about all sorts of things. And 25 years for a long and then time, the battle to there. try and get some sort of yeah. uh, recompense. And that seems so despicable, doesn't it? That on the day that he is, you know, totally absolved and the judge is kind of, that there isn't just an enormous check just going, we can't do anything about it. But he, you know, you'll never, it'll be difficult for you to get work, but, you know, don't worry about money again. I mean, surely Sorry. that's just a straightforward thing, but it's not, clearly. Not as easy as that, is it? Well, we'll find out about how difficult it is to hand money out or not. So the <laughs> Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, seems to be dishing up rather a lot of it at the moment, doesn't he? Uh, half price meal deals. Uh, but is his mini budget yesterday enough to rescue the economy and how will it be paid for? Are you going to benefit from it? Let us know, actually. I've got a yeah. friend who's moving house today, thrilled with the stamp duty holiday until nice. March next year. Are you going to be taking up the, uh, the meal deal option? Will that mean that you're more inclined to go out for dinner? Maybe yeah. go to a local pub, go to a local restaurant? Uh, you're watching Good Morning Britain on ITV. See you in a moment.